Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy false prophets and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor as the labor progresses the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes as we get closer to jesus return all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense all of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The United States is unprepared for the most serious security threats it's faced since World War II. That's the warning defense experts delivered to a Senate committee this week. CBN's Del Hurd reports. The heads of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy told the Senate Armed Services Committee that the United States is nowhere near prepared for the dangerous multi-threat environment it's facing. The public has no idea how great the threats are. Commission Chairman Representative Jane Harmon and Vice Chair Ambassador Eric Edelman issued a dire warning to the committee Tuesday. The homeland, if there's a conflict, is not going to be a sanctuary anymore in the first uh, attacks will likely be in the cyber cyber domain and they will be incredibly uh, disabling. The public is essentially clueless about the massive cyber attacks that could be launched any day by our adversaries, not just nation states, but rogue actors as well. The report warns a cyber war with China or Russia would be devastating. America's critical infrastructure would come under attack, possibly cutting off power, water, transportation, and financial systems, and shutting down the supply chain. The report states major war would affect the life of every American in ways we can only begin to imagine. The report echoes a warning FBI Director Christopher Wray gave Congress. China's hackers are positioning on American infrastructure in preparation to wreak havoc and cause real-world harm to American citizens and communities if and when China decides the time has come to strike. One of the things we might anticipate, for example, is if China decides to annex Taiwan or whatever euphemism they might use, uh, they might uh, engage in a major cyber attack here first, for which we are underprepared. The commission found the U.S. defense sector lacking in almost every area, including integrated weapons technology platforms and software. With recruitment levels for all branches lagging, America needs a larger fighting force. And the hearing discussed lowering physical standards for recruits and even instituting a draft. We found that the joint force is at the breaking point of maintaining readiness today. Adding more burden without adding resources to rebuild readiness will cause it to break. And with so many cyber threats, the commission also said the Pentagon must find a way to somehow lure the best and brightest computer minds away from Silicon Valley and into national service. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. 
This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Iran's Ayatollah, Ayatollah has reportedly ordered a direct Iranian attack on the Jewish state. His threat comes in retaliation for the killing of a top Hamas leader on Iranian soil. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is warning that anyone who strikes Israel, quote, will exact a heavy price from any aggression on any front. Chris Mitchell reports on the growing concerns the conflict will escalate into a one wider war. On Wednesday, the funeral procession of Hamas leader Ismail Haniya made its way to the streets of Tehran. While Israel has not claimed responsibility for his death, the New York Times reports Iran's Ayatollah Khamenei has ordered a direct strike on Israel in retaliation for the attack on Iranian soil. A senior Hamas leader said Haniya's death affects ongoing negotiations between the terror group and the Jewish state. There is no point in talking about ceasefire negotiations amid bloodshed and assassinations. The IDF also confirmed the death of Mohammed Def, Hamas's number two leader in Gaza, on July 13th. In an address to the nation Wednesday night, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel is prepared for any retaliation. There are challenging days ahead of us. Since the attack in Beirut, threats have been heard from all sides. We are prepared for any scenario and will stand united and determined against any threat. Israel will exact a heavy price from any aggression against us on any front. He emphasized Iran is the power behind all the threats. Since the beginning of the war, I have conveyed that we are in a struggle against Iran's axis of evil. This is a war of existence against a stranglehold of terrorist armies and missiles that Iran wants to tighten around our necks. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said America will stand by Israel in the event of an attack. Israel is attacked. We certainly uh, will help defend Israel. You, see, you saw us do that in April. Uh, you can expect to see us do that again. Middle East expert Avi Melamed expects a calculated retaliation by Iran. It will be on the one hand a powerful and send a message, but on the other hand will be very careful not to result in a dynamic that will actually result in an all out war. Melamed adds Israel is sending a message with these twin strikes. You could read the Israeli message to one as one that says we are willing, able and ready to be engaged in a whole out war, which is not something that I think the Iranian regime actually is interested in at this, at this conjunction, at this time. These latest crises come as Israel marks the 300th day since the October 7th attack. On the front page of the Jerusalem Post, it reads in English and Hebrew, our hope is not yet lost. Big picture for a second. Our enemies appear to be coming, to be becoming uh, more aligned. In the last three years, Russia, yeah. China, Iran, North Korea, they've all come True. together to challenge American power. We're facing a concerted global challenge. My question is, are we prepared? No, we're not. It all comes down very simply to presidential leadership. The guidance that the president provides as commander in chief and leader of the national security team, our adversaries don't respond to kindness. They respond to force and to pressure. And that's what you need to do. But it comes out of one place. It comes out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the commander in chief. You could be the strongest military in the world, but if you're not willing to use it, and you're not willing to use it in, in either threat or demands, then it means nothing. Nothing to you and nothing to your adversaries. Obviously, the biggest concern here is that there is an escalation that leads to a, a wider, larger war in, in the region. Here's the White House response to uh, the reaction to this Beirut, south of Beirut attack. And here's what they said about it. Watch. We do not believe uh, that an all-out war is inevitable. That is not something that we believe, and we believe that it can still be avoided. There's a diplomatic solution here, and that's what we're trying to get to. General Keene, your thoughts on what's going on here? Yeah, well, some of that's a stunning res uh, revelation, because that's what this administration has been about right from the outset, when they began three years ago, and eased back on the Trump sanctions and told the Iranians they did that as a concession so they can make diplomatic foray and return to the nuclear deal. This appeasement strategy has failed miserably as a strategic strategy. And here we are still playing it out in the middle of a war. And our closest ally in the region is fighting for its very existence. I believe administration officials every single day should remind the American people and the world writ large that this is an existential threat to Israel to exterminate them 
as a body where the people no longer want to live in Israel because the situation is so volatile. Does Iran look at this moment where we have a, a lame duck president, I think is, is very, um, you know, I think it's a, a real characterization of what's going on at the White House, and, another, and the vice president who is out campaigning. Does Iran see this as a window to wipe Israel off the map or to make a lot of strides toward that goal, General? That Iran stepped up their aggression with this administration and has been steady marching towards that goal of doing two things, drive the United States out of the region militarily and diplomatically as much as possible and destroy the state of Israel. Remember, before October the 7th, there were over 125 attacks by Iranian-backed Shia militia in Iraq and Syria. Over 125. That was before October the 7th. This aggression has been there for a long time. And the United States has failed to pin the rose on Iran. We now have the commander of Central Command for our audience. He commands all of our forces in the region. He has repeatedly asked for permission to shut down the Houthis by attacking Iran's capability to resupply them and take down their spy ship that's targeting for them in the Red Sea. And it keeps getting rejected. And as a result of that, the Suez Canal is essentially shut down. Is that a check mark for the Iranians in terms of this is something they strategically wanted to accomplish in terms of their influence and control of the region? You betcha. Sure and what is. are we doing? We're in, we're in a defensive crouch as opposed mm -hmm. to an offensive crouch and stopping them from doing it. So this is just another step, I think, to answer your question. Iran has been on the march, and they're going to continue to be on the march. A final farewell. Ayatollah Ali Khamenei leads prayers for Ismail Haniya and his bodyguard, killed in the Iranian capital on Wednesday. Thousands poured onto the streets in a show of solidarity with the political leader of Hamas. Haniya's body was taken from Tehran University to Freedom Square and eventually to Mehrabad Airport, where it was flown to Doha for his burial on Friday. The 62-year-old was a guest at the inauguration ceremony of the newly elected President Masoud Pezeshkian. It was Haniya's fourth trip to Tehran since October 7th, and his assassination is being viewed here as a work of Israel with the help of the United States. Washington says it played no part in it and had no prior knowledge of the attack. Israel has not commented. The time for the occupation to attack without response is over. They've done something and they must pay the price. They must be held responsible. America is responsible for this. No crime is committed by the occupation without the criminal America. Senior Iranian officials see the strike on Iranian soil as a declaration of war, and they have promised revenge. This time, Iran's response will be different. In the last one, it informed regional countries in advance about the timing of the retaliation to prevent a disaster. But I think this time its response will be a surprise, and it will come much sooner. On April 13th, Iran launched more than 300 drones and missiles towards Israel in response to an airstrike on its consulate in Damascus two weeks before. Israel responded by attacking Iran's air defense systems near the Natanz nuclear facility. Ismail Haniyeh's assassination has once again forced Iranian officials to make a difficult decision, one that's ultimately up to the supreme leader. If Iran attacks Israel again, it's unlikely to act alone. The so-called resistance front, which includes the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the popular mobilization forces in Iraq would be expected to take part making this a critical moment for the Middle East. Zechariah 12.6 In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. The Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17.1 In which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49 the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. 
and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. These are the moments on Wednesday when kamikaze drones attacked a crowd of dignitaries at a military base in eastern Sudan in what the army says was an attempt to assassinate Abdul Fattah al-Burhan. The general escaped unharmed, but several people were killed and injured at the graduation ceremony at Jebeit. Afterwards, he was defiant and cheered on by his officers. He blamed the rapid support forces for the attack. We have to put an end to those rebels who terrorize the Sudanese everywhere. We salute you, and through you, we send our message to our people everywhere that we will not retreat, we will not surrender, and we will not negotiate with any party, no matter who it is. The statement backtracks on an earlier commitment Burhan made to join ceasefire negotiations in Switzerland later this month. The Rapid Support Forces had also agreed to participate in the discussions, hosted by the US and Saudi Arabia. The group denies responsibility for the drone strike. Now these peace talks appear in doubt. The uncompromising message comes at a time when the fighting has intensified, with government forces losing control of several important cities and the capital of northern Darfur, Al Fasha, under siege by the paramilitary group. The country is going through a major situation, and you are seeing its repercussions now. It's a situation which requires all of us to unite, to be strong, and to carry our guns, because there is no solution for this country except with a gun. The two sides have been battling for control for nearly 16 months in a conflict that's killed thousands and created what the UN says is the world's worst displacement crisis. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Another earthquake rattles West Texas, sending aftershocks as far away as DFW. The 5.1 magnitude quake happened at about 9.30 this morning in Scurry County, which is about 200 miles west of Fort Worth. Scurry County officials say the area has had 61 earthquakes in the last seven days, causing structural damage to homes and businesses. We want to update this earthquake that happened earlier this morning. We just got word that the Scurry County judge declared a disaster in that area, and he's requesting state assistance. And the number was 61 earthquakes in just the past seven days. Right, yeah. And that's quite significant, mm -hmm. Chris. I mean, we felt the Monday night earthquake that was uh, originally it was a 4.9 uh, and there were a couple that followed after that on Monday night mm -hmm. but we felt that here in North Texas we felt another one this morning. For the judge out there to make this declaration it's got to be affecting people maybe more so than we realize. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the house falling down on top of us. I mean you, you figure. I mean you see in movies. You know, where all these Tommy Lee Jones people play these parts and stuff, but this is not a movie. This is real life. Back to back earthquakes in Scurry County are causing mental distress for some people there. The latest earthquake hit early this morning. K Texas reporter Karina Hollingsworth spoke with one man who says he's tired of all the shaking. Multiple earthquakes have shaken up Scurry County off of Highway 180 over the past week. And Dundeeville told me seven earthquakes have routed up his home in just 24 hours. And he fears these quakes are just getting started. It moved all of that. It took a screw that was in the wall here from up there that was that long. It, it just puked it out and it was in the two by four and put that on the ground to see where it, I would have hated for this to hit me in the head to see the dent it did in the floor there in there. That probably hurt. Don Devil told me as earthquake after earthquake caused his home to tremor. He can't help but wonder when the next one will strike. It's traumatizing. You'll be in bed asleep and to have that wake you up it's like putting you in a jar. You take and put a marble in the jar and just shake it. It's what the house does. And when you're in bed, it, it, it scares the bejesus out of you. 
Bevo says when a 5.0 magnitude earthquake attacks, damage to homes are unavoidable. Well, there's places in the ceiling where you can see the nails coming down. It, it's, uh, it's, it's messing up the house. The Scurry County resident told me back-to-back -back earthquakes are not something he thought he'd ever experience while living in Texas. We've had a big increase in the, in the, in the earthquakes. In the last seven days, there's been like 61 of them. We didn't have this before now. And now with earthquakes, now a part of this new normal, Devil says his mind wanders about the worst possibilities. Having somebody come dig me out from underneath the rubble, that's a fear. It appears changes to our planet are now accelerating. The number of earthquakes around the globe continues to rise and volcanoes are beginning to behave in some unusual ways. We are far more vulnerable to natural disasters than most people realize, and it looks like the shaking of our planet is only going to intensify in the months and years ahead. We were warned by the prophets of old, and even Jesus himself, that these things would take place right before his return. Now to the west, and the Park Fire is the fifth largest in California history. It's destroyed nearly 300 structures in its path. Okay, yeah, that Park Fire now 18% contained, but uh, firefighters still trying to get a handle on this fire. This is very much a race against time. As Ginger mentioned, those extreme heat temperatures, triple digit temperatures moving into the area, and that will make conditions on the ground for firefighters all the more challenging. This morning, wildfires wreaking havoc on the west coast. Thousands of personnel have been battling the park fire for a week, but the fire steadily growing bigger, becoming the fifth largest in state history. Well, this is just a small taste of what firefighters continue to deal with. These spot fires popping up with the potential of spreading. But the park fire here in Northern California is not the only fire burning. There are dozens and dozens throughout the West. <laughs> Christy and Michael Denu of Paradise, California, lost their home in the 2018 fire that ravaged the town. Now, the home they rebuilt in Cohasset, also gone. But this time, they were able to save some priceless possessions. One of the most important things I grabbed was me and my brother and sister have my mom's ashes along with my dad. And so I was able to grab a few little pictures and her ashes. Firefighters in Southern California battling the Nixon fire, which has grown to more than 4,900 acres with 0% containment since Monday. Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. A summer of wildfire not letting up with multiple infernos now raging in Colorado. If the wind switches directions, um, I think that we could be in big trouble. The Stone Canyon fire northwest of Denver now deadly. One person was killed after flames tore through homes in the town of Lyons. Five structures up in smoke. And late today, a new fire burning homes in the hills of Boulder. Further south, the quarry fire igniting overnight, almost 600 homes evacuated. There was a flashlight uh, shining in the window, and it was the sheriff telling us we had to evacuate. The fire, small but challenging, with crews and resources stretched thin. Joe Lorenz has been watching the fire grow. What's your biggest concern right now? I don't want to lose my home. I don't want to lose my neighbors. Every neighborhood in this facility is at risk. This fire is not an easy fight. The terrain is treacherous. And this is what they're talking about here, this steep terrain. On top of that, another big concern are rattlesnakes. There are a lot of them here making it even more dangerous and challenging for firefighters to do their job and get that under control. This fire among 95 burning across the West, including in Oregon, Washington, and California where crews are getting a handle on the massive park fire after it chewed through more than 300 structures. As evacuees return home, some finding nothing left behind. It's just the hope that maybe you'll flip something over and it won't be ashes. Those storms are only making matters worse in Vermont, where overnight flooding has left some communities devastated. In some parts of Vermont, eight inches plus of rain fell within a 24-hour period, leaving behind scenes of destruction like this. I want to take you on a little walk to see just what's left behind. It's hard to believe that this is the product of a single Rainstorm we're seeing downed trees, downed power lines, homes completely submerged in mud. In fact, this whole area was submerged up until around 3 o'clock this afternoon. The water has now receded. I feel like I'm in a nightmare. I, 
I'm just waiting to wake up. I, there's no other way to really describe it. Her house, my other neighbor's house, my house is torn to shreds. I mean, my roof's there, my house is over there. My bedroom walls are down there. It's absolute disaster. Speaking to meteorologists, and they're telling me that this is the product of climate change. They said that Vermont has just simply not seen this much rain in recent years. They're pointing to that change in the climate. Soldiers and rescuers work through slush and rocks under steady rain, looking for survivors and searching for bodies in the hills of India's Kerala state on Wednesday, a day after scores of people were killed in monsoon landslides. Huddled in shelters, survivors said they had lost everything. In the morning. I've lost my son and grandchild. The river swept them away. I don't have a life anymore. I have lost everything. They have found the body of my son. We'll go to the mortuary to see his body. My family was in Mundakai. They're all dead. They found two bodies, but they have yet to find the bodies of six to seven other family members. I don't have a place to live now. I don't have the ability now to find work and build a home. So I'm sitting here distressed, wondering what to do next. Around 1,000 people had been rescued from the hillside villages and tea and cardamom estates in Wayanad district, but authorities said many were still missing. Heavy rain in Kerala led to the landslides early on Tuesday, sending torrents of mud, water and tumbling boulders downhill and burying or sweeping people away to their deaths as they slept. It was the worst disaster in the state since deadly floods in 2018. Experts said the area had been receiving heavy rainfall in the last two weeks, which had softened the soil, and that extremely heavy rainfall on Monday triggered the landslides. The Indian Army said it had begun the process to construct an alternate bridge after the main bridge linking the worst affected area to the nearest town was destroyed. The region hit by the landslide was forecast to get 8 inches of rainfall, but ended up getting 22.5 inches over a period of 48 hours, Kerala's chief minister said on Tuesday. India has witnessed extreme weather conditions in recent years, from torrential rain and floods to droughts and cyclones, blamed by some experts on climate change. India's monsoon rains were supposed to bring relief from scorching heat. Instead, flooding and landslides triggered disaster killing dozens in the southern state of Kerala. Extreme weather crises blamed by some experts on climate change. Around the world, rising temperatures have led to heat warnings, forest fires, wilting crops across Asia, Europe and the U.S. According to new data compiled by NASA, July 22nd was the hottest day on record for the planet ever, part of what scientists call a long-term warming trend driven by human activities, primarily the emission of greenhouse gases. <laughs> Few places on Earth show the critical challenge of extreme and rising heat like India, <laughs> where record heat waves this summer had temperatures hovering at 115 degrees or higher intense hot stretches that experts say are longer and more dangerous. People who don't live in India might think, well, India is always hot. The heat wave um, advisories have come in consecutively for the third year now. This year has uh, undoubtedly been intolerable. The concern is when humidity is added to temperature, known as a wet bulb measurement. When that level approaches the body's temperature, it's harder for humans to sweat and survive. In a report last November, the World Bank warned that wet bulb temperatures in India could make it one of the first places to test that threshold. Already in teeming cities like New Delhi, drinking water for millions is so scarce that the government has moved to ration it. The water trucks come two or three times a day here, but it runs out fast and there's never enough. Sales of air conditioners have surged, but only for those who can afford it. The International Energy Agency predicts that by 2050, India will have a billion ACs going, all of them kicking off even more heat. Unless we start the change in ourselves and start bringing the change in our daily life, uh, climate change will not get better. This should not be the norm. People need to start realizing this is not okay. India's government has long had a heat action plan. But people are being forced to adapt to a new era of temperatures 
that just keep rising. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready!
time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.